Hey, everyone. Before we start, I just wanted to say we've had such a great countdown to season four. We have been blessed with amazing guests. Uh, we have also been a tiny bit plagued with technical issues. The sound quality about 40 minutes in is not going to be as good as the beginning. So I apologize about that. But the content is fabulous. Toby Schmidt's fabulous. And uh, we do get a few appearances from Jack as well. So enjoy. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. And finally, we have the guest we've been waiting for for ages. At long last, <laughs> we have Toby Schmitz here with us. Hello, everyone. <gasps> Toby Schmitz, welcome to the show. Hi, Liz. Hi, Daphne. It's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a favorite for a long time, I hope you know. Well, I'm aware because I listen to the podcast that I'm. Oh, I'm not, I'm that's not right. On, I'm not. A, I'm not on the least favorite list, but uh, yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. You and Jack, we've not been shy about that. I forget that you listen. That's insane. <laughs> we try mm. to forget that when we're. Yeah, I think that's wise. <laughs> we're actually recording now. We can't. <laughs> you're right here with yes. us. Yes. I won't mention it again. Yeah, we try not to think <laughs> about people who actually listen to us when we're talking, but just. Yeah, just chat together because otherwise your head starts to spin pretty quickly. Completely. Yep, totally. Lots of people you could offend or, you know, just embarrass yourself in front of. So, <laughs> yep, pretty much. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Toby, you've been kind of our guardian angel, I feel like, this whole time. Were you the first person to start listening to us? No, I think I might have been the first person to tune in and I honestly can't remember which link I followed you know on Twitter to find you guys I'd assumed that Luke Arnold would have been listening to you before me and was surprised to find when I said to him hey you've been listening to these guys um you know they're spreading the love and talking about it with great intelligence and love he was he said no tell me how to how to tune in so uh yeah, I, I can't remember how I found you guys, um, but it was sometime, you know, during uh, only after a few episodes, uh, and yeah, I tuned right in. It's also part of the life that we led in Cape Town was a lot of oh. downtime, a lot of solo time, you know, a lot of treadmill time, and podcasts suddenly became a, a real way to stay sane. And um, I'm glad I found of you course. guys. Yeah, yay! We are glad. Thank you. Too. Yeah, we are too. <laughs> It's been super as fun. As horrifying as it was at first, we are glad now. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know for a little while, luckily. It was Lauren who told it's us. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Daphne here, the consummate professional that she is now, was actually terrified of the idea of having her voice heard at all when we first got started. So she was trying to get me and some other person to isn't do a that, podcast. Isn't that crazy? She's got such a great speaking voice. And, and I'm Daphne. I on. know. <laughs> Come on. You wouldn't want that on the airways. <laughs> it's great, right? <laughs> She's our NPR girl. I know. I don't know what she's been doing this whole time. <laughs> okay. So I had an idea for a structure for this, for this podcast. Mm -hmm. Liz, ah. Liz asked a while ago, um, which Shakespearean character does Jack think he is? And which one do you, Toby, think that Jack is? I gave it great thought, actually. And oh my gosh! <laughs> Sorry, I'm flattered by that. Because it, well, that's it's very hard. I mean, all those Shakespearean characters are so three dimensional, as are the, mm. the Black Sails characters, and it's hard to sort of just match up in you know a kind of kind of in a in a flip way. But but eventually, what I came to think about it was, is that I think that Jack egotistical Jack, hard put upon, uh, thinks that he's surrounded by fools and uh, doesn't mm -hmm. suffer fools wisely and so on, probably mm -hmm. sees himself in a fairly tragic role a la Hamlet, you know, the sort of the smartest Shakespearean character out uh -huh. there really, you know, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. um, but... <laughs> But I, th I imagine that Jack probably thinks of himself probably along the Hamlet lines. Um, and, and Hamlet would have been a hit at the time. I mean, the play was very well known. In fact, one, ah, of, yes. one of the first known 
uh, performances of Hamlet, one of the first recorded performances of Hamlet, is actually on a on a slaving ship somewhere in the Caribbean or off the coast of Africa somewhere. I can't remember where. Interestingly, oh, I had so, no idea. And and Jack kind of like Will, you know, grew up as in a mercantile English town with a with an mm-hmm. important dad, and I've always assumed had some level of classical education. Um, so Jack, as a side thought, would have been well aware of the works of Shakespeare. Um, I think that all the characters in Black Sails, or most of them rather, probably see themselves as having a little bit of a Iago to them, you know, able to, to bump people <gasps> oh, up, yeah. bump, you know, slit throats without having any real sort yeah. of moral, moral repercussions. But I think we all know that mm. if, you, if you kill people, there's something happens to you. So maybe more realistically, they've all got a little bit of, you know, Macbeth in them that if you bump people off, then that's going to catch up with you, you know, especially if it's for ah. am- ambitious reasons, that they've probably all got a bit of sure. Mac- Macbeth in these characters. And, I mean, the clues in the titles to this show, they're all sinking into the black, oily sea, you know, tragedy, mm-hmm. tragedies written all over them. But Toby himself, I think, equates Jack with a character I have played uh, in the in the Shakespearean canon, which is Benedict in in Much Ado About Nothing. He's a he's a professional. Really, aha. Uh-huh. He's a soldier. Um, he's quite a, uh-huh. a savvy savvy one. One would assume maybe a little bit yes. of a lazy one, and he puts wit above mm. anything else. It's more important to him than life and death, and he also doesn't suffer fools um, gladly. And uh, the poet Auden said about. Benedict and his lover Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. They're, mm-hmm. the, they're the two out of all the Shakespearean characters that you'd want to sit next to at a dinner table. And I kind of feel that way about Amen Jack. Amen that, yes. You know, uh-huh. like, you'd have yeah, a good time. Yeah, I do. So, so I think Jack... Absolutely I would. Goodness, uh, yeah. I think Jack thinks of himself in a sort of romantic Hamlet way. And mm-hmm. I, Toby, think about Jack in a, in a Benedict Much Ado About Nothing way. You know, yeah. he's, a, he's a bit more lovable to me than I think Jack sure. would, would admit to being. <laughs> Are you happy, That's Liz? great. I like that very much. So the structure that I wanted to do for the whole podcast, that I thought all of my questions I would like for you to answer both as Toby. And as Jack. And as Jack. All right, to, 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 <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I right. love this already. Right. Drink more, but yes. That's, that's right. Do I do the voice as well? Uh, All right. Feel free. Yeah. Right. Yes, you should. <laughs> Pretty sure the listeners would appreciate that. Although I also heard from, I think it was Lauren Sarner asked us uh, that there were a couple of different voices and accents that you had thought of for Jack earlier on yeah. that before you landed where you did. Oh, that's true. Lauren asked us because she said that's something that doesn't come out in writing, but that would be great on a podcast. Yeah. Well, I arrived onto Black Sails as one of the last cast. And some of my accent choice was informed by the writing. You know, he seemed like a fairly intelligent guy. And um, yeah. the, char- the character description in the um, audition brief was think of himself, think of him as a, uh, a, a Wall Street, you know, trader equivalent. So obviously he was going to be fairly sharp. Ah. Um, but mm-hmm. And some of it was also dictated by the fact that Certain accents had been nabbed. You know, it, Zach, Zach had already chosen his voice. <laughs> and, you know, um, I thought that maybe there was space for someone who could talk very fast and in, in a sort of an erudite way. I'd also just finished playing Elliot Chase in a production of Private Lives in Sydney, which is, you yes, know, sort of, yes. sort of the, you know, the very acme of, of Noel Coward, you know, sort of speaking right. like this kind of place. And I also had thought in my own thinking that that Jack might have spent a bit of time in the Royal Navy. And so whatever his original, oh. you know, accent was from the north of England, I'd imagine like a lot of English people had um, changed it to fit in to an, another environment and that his accent was a bit of a construction. So for all those reasons, um, uh-huh. I, I sort of came up with the way he spoke, sort of like a sort of a 1930s RAF pilot. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it seemed to fit in and no one told me not to. Actually, I think it was about sort of we'd already got a couple of ep- episodes in the can and John or someone said, is, is that the voice you're doing? I was like, yeah, man, way too late. <laughs> right, it's definitely the voice I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, can't really 
really have him yeah, change it a few episodes yeah, in. That would yeah. be odd. Yeah. <laughs> We would have noticed. We will do questions now as, do you want Jack first or Toby first? I'll, 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 you just I'll wing it. Wing you do it. it. Yeah. As you yeah, say. yeah, yeah, that's right. So. As the spirit moves. Okay, my first question that is very important and uh, very insightful, I think. What is the Hogwarts house of Jack Rackham? I think everybody needs to know because we can't land on it. Sure. I nev- I've never read a Harry Potter book or seen a film. <laughs> Are you just telling me lies or are you being serious right now? As far, as far as I can tell from the fandoms out there, it's like a Slytherin or a Ravenclaw thing. Is that making sense? That's the problem, is that he's kind of both. Gotcha. Does, is anyone in the Harry Potter universe allowed to straddle two houses? Is that a thing? <laughs> yes. Okay. It's a hat stall. Okay. Yeah, well, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. Could he be one of I'm them? just flying my nerd flag high sure. right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just... Just the word Slytherin always struck me as, as seeming a little overtly evil, just as the sight of that Malfoy right. kid in the, in the trailers right. with, his, with his white hair. <laughs> so maybe, maybe Ravenclaw, a little bit yes. of both, or somewhere straddling two worlds? That's exactly what we say. So, yeah, cool. I take that. Absolutely. That's what we said. I called you a hat stall between Ravenclaw and Slytherin, so you nailed it as far as I'm concerned. Right. Okay, so do we think that Jack feels same? I think Jack, if he were to have read the, the J.K. Rowling <laughs> series, would <laughs> would would um, probably say um, whatever you'd like him to be, I think. That's right. That's right. And that would be Slytherin. Yeah, right. there you go. <laughs> Very interesting. Hmm. All righty. Okay. Next up. <laughs> or Jack could say that, you know, he's very particular about his library and hasn't read those books and has no opinion on the, on the subject whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what Jack should say, yeah. actually. Uh, that would be, you just made a whole lot of people happy yeah, by saying that. Yeah. <laughs> For shame. <laughs> I'm only mostly kidding. It's fine. It's fine. My respect is still way up here. No, no shame. No, no shame. <laughs> Touche, my good man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Jack is an interesting character and very obviously different than uh, the other pirates. Mm-hmm. What, what do both Toby and Jack see as Jack's role in this community? Like, story-wise, also personality-wise, like, where, where mm-hmm. do you feel, like, what do you feel like is Jack's importance here i think that jack definitely brings some levity into the show uh he does thank god yeah sure (laughs) i mean it's definitely definitely (laughs) needed and that's not to say that others don't Mm -hmm. you know all the characters have their moments where the eyebrow goes up and you get a good hearty chuckle out of them but i think Mm -hmm. it's definitely part of his personality and probably one of the ways he's survived is he says his wits um but wit itself, you know, like Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, um, he considers it an, a very important tool for survival. Mm-hmm. And there's no better way than escaping the tyrant or the bully's clutches than by making a, a good gag, you know, or having the insight mm-hmm. of, a, of a good bit of humour. So I think he brings that to the show and definitely to the island and to the cruise that he belongs to. I think that in the community, his role is one of information. You know, I think he's very happy to share the gossip oh. or the, the info with anyone who's willing to pay for it or willing mm-hmm. to give him um, a, a foot up for it. You know, I think even the first episode, you see him chin wagging with Singleton of all people at the bar. Oh, that's true. You know, or then suddenly he's dropping in, oh, yes. dro- dropping in for a chat with Gates a few episodes in. You know, he's a uh-huh. he's a very social butterfly, um, whereas a lot of the mm-hmm. other characters don't have the ego or the the personality type for it. They'd rather be you know have their arm chewed off than be seen cavorting with you know strangers or the enemy in a social situation when it's just no problem for jack so i think that's an important bit Mm. of sort of glue for the island and for the show is that he's quite happy to uh, and i always think about all the off-screen stuff that jack must have done you know whose ear was he in who was he having a a chat Mm -hmm. to at the bar Mm -hmm. you know between episodes Okay, so that's Toby's answer. What is Jack's answer? <laughs> uh, Jack would probably uh, believe that he is 
is there to, you know, take his rightful position as leader of the island, maybe the free world. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the great thing about playing Jack is that I'm not sure he has such long-term goals or objectives as some of the other characters do or even you have to normally have as a uh, as an actor is go what's my sure. objective i think that he is wonderfully selfish and self-centered mm. and really mm -hmm. f and very emotional so i think he thinks in the short term a lot he has vague long term goals i want my name right. my name to be up there in lights and i think one of the yeah. things that really aids his selfishness or enables it is the partnership with Anne and his love for Anne. He has deep right. feelings for her, has very mature feelings for her in the way that he would protect her and be a, a man and an adult for her. And, um, and, yes. and, it's, and it's not a, a conservative kind of relationship. It's complex in a way that allows him to sure. be extremely childish in the rest of his life, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> You know, and I as, uh, yeah, I, sure. as, I as an actor have always relished playing or knowing what my character's blinkers are, where they suck a bit, you know, what makes them not a, not a very good human. And, and, uh -huh. and you're told early on at acting school you can't play your hurdles, you know, otherwise you end up kind of going out and doing a cod, oh, I've got a limp and an eye patch and I'm a baddie, sure. you know. But uh -huh. I think it's at the same time it's very helpful to know what your character's limitations are so you can what their walls are what their blinkers are so you can run headlong mm -hmm. into them you know jack has no idea what his problems are he doesn't know the kind of uh -huh. self analysis that we do in 2017 yeah. or mm -hmm. or even just as humans jack's you know a fairly selfish guy but i know what his problems are what his limitations are and i really enjoy running smack into them as mm -hmm. an actor and I think he's he's yeah. very selfish and greedy he would say no I'm yes. Jack would say no I am uh, rightfully ambitious and proactive and and so right. on and and mm -hmm. and I'm only chasing the things I deserve in life the things that have been taken from me but um, mm -hmm. I see that I'm I quite enjoy seeing them in, in negative terms. And I think he's a really selfish, egotistical guy. Of course. <laughs> uh-huh. This is always what Liz has said about Jack. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, maybe the argument could be said that, you know, we all are or, or a lot of the characters in this show are um, for different reasons and in different ways. Sure. But this sort of this obsession with having his name up in lights but no real battle plan yes. for how to do it I think is very telling. Hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For me, that is what has always made Jack dangerous to Anne and why I liked seeing her relationship with Max take off the way that it did and for her to gain some autonomy and independence from him because he had a way of seeing his name and himself mm -hmm. apart from Anne in a way that I don't think that she ever quite had or grasped. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I also really enjoyed hearing John talk a couple of weeks ago about a sense of them being yes. twins, yeah. Yeah. you know, that there's just something otherworldly yes. about their partnership. Mm -hmm. And it happened a long time ago before we ever met them on this show. Maybe Jack only started reaching for his name in lights for those particular stars because he had Anne by his side. Hmm. I, you know, Oh, isn't that lovely? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think he can think of himself without the appendage of her as much as she says the same of him. Right. Um, That's it's good. not worth separating them theoretically, you know. I, I, I can't, as Toby, I can't imagine the two of them not together. And I think Jack probably mm. very often selfishly doesn't include Anne in his plans. Mm. And I like to think that Anne doesn't expect to be included, you know, in oh. his in his <laughs> plans. She just expects to be taken care of. You know, that's the kind of the you know, the general feeling I have about those two. Um, but, oh, you know, you guys mm -hmm. have been talking recently as to whether Jack's ambition for a legacy disappears in season four or it's been replaced by something else. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think a leopard can really change his spots, <laughs> you know, especially yeah. in, in, in this world. At the same time, 
he has completely changed right. since the death of Charles. You know, something fundamental has shifted yes. in him. I don't think we jettison old parts of ourselves. No, I think we not. just accumulate new bits. Right. No, no, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a sort of a, a comic I version think... where, where Jack wants the island named after him with, <laughs> with a sort of a mini golf course, you know. With a... uh-huh. or, like, or like Rackham slash Avery. Like he would like hyphenated Avery, Rackham Avery name. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think there's also a sort of a more emotional ambition of his is he wants to be noticed and he wants people to like him. And that's very human. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do like that very much. Yes. Yeah. And and that helps me understand to his relationship with Charles. I don't. I wish that we saw more of Charles and Jack together because those scenes were always so lovely. I just watched um, three hundred one yesterday, and yeah. that scene where you're where Jack rather is just floundering is act- and it's so hard for me to see him just yeah. well floundering and, and and flailing about and trying to to grasp what he so clearly sees and wants to get yeah. and doing it right in that room in front of Charles mm-hmm. and yeah. Anne and the vulnerability there was beautiful and that's actually the moment where i got the question about the shakespeare character because what it reminded me of comically mm. was um peter quince and the mechanicals sure absolutely <laughs> Yeah. Right, in Midsummer Night, and just this idea, like, I see the vision of the thing, I know how I want to do yeah. it, but these idiots around me, without recognizing his own... Yes, that's right. ...also incompetence yeah. and, and, and <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, totally. And I think 301 is great for all sorts of reasons. One, you get to mm-hmm. catch up with a whole lot of stuff that's happened off screen, which this show does really well. Uh-huh. It makes you a Absolutely. very active viewer. So beautifully. Um, you get to a good mm-hmm. slab of his relationship with Charles, which you assume had been there yes. even before 101, and you get to really delve into a bit of that. And also yes. we're not interested in seeing Jack as king of the castle sitting on a pile of gold and having a good time. You know, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. We, we think you think you want that, right. but this show is very good at taking away the thing that people want once they get it awfully quickly. <laughs> yes, we've talked about that a few times. <laughs> yeah. Can't remember which of the creators who, who was talking to me about it, but they decided that having Jack sitting on his golden throne in 301, reading the paper, in, uh-huh. in, enjoying his riches, mm-hmm. lasts for just under five seconds. Yep. And then there's that mm-hmm. rap on the door, which he knows is 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 Anne's rap, and it's and it all falls apart from that point on. That's that's how long he gets to enjoy his his wealth and his power in the in the mm-hmm. eyes of the audience is just under five seconds. Well, on the toilet, which is very yeah, important. Yeah, absolutely, with his cellist <laughs> playing. So fitting yeah. again yeah. of all the thrones. Yeah, yes, that's right. <laughs> but yes, I I think that the show has been very good at giving you just enough of what you really want. Yes, I'd love to have heaps of scenes between Charles and Jack. I'd love to have more scenes between, um, you know, Dimples and Thomas. I'd love to have a whole lot of things. (laughs) But they give you just enough of what you want and then go Mm -hmm. treat them, you know, treat them mean to keep them keen. Sorry, I'm just... Uh That pleased her sorry, so much. Sorry, you just distracted me by calling him Dimples. <laughs> no, you know what I wanted? I wanted scenes between Jack and Silver. That's what I wanted. Sure. Yeah. That's right. We barely got that at all. As, as Andrew pointed out in your last um, pod, they occupy a lot of the same space, though. Yeah. Uh, and, yes. And what you'd actually benefit from plot-wise might be hard to actually pin down from those two. And they're from completely different camps. I li- I've always liked Luke's theory that those two were thick as mm-hmm. thieves in the bar mm-hmm. off screen. I love that. Trading information yeah, all the yeah. way down the line. And why wouldn't they, you know? Sure. Erudite, of charming survivors. Yep, exactly. They'd be talking mm-hmm. somehow. See, now you just made an argument for Slytherin for sure. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> True enough. Yeah. Yep. Well, I like to think, yeah, that – well, I won't get into that. Yes. Anyway, I have my theories. Go ahead. Oh, are we talking about theories for the future? We don't need to get into No. Okay. All right. Fascinating. Now I'm fascinated. <laughs> oh, it's just Harry Potter nerdery. There's nothing to be fascinated oh, about. Oh, yeah. I'll geek out with somebody yeah, else you're, about yeah, it at, at you're, a later you're date. Ta- you're, yeah, you're talking to two people who can't, can't 
can't be satisfying exactly. on so that level. It. I won't cast my pearls and before you, you, you swine. Uh, and probably are not going to read them at this point in our lives. You know, like, wasn't like a hundred of them. I guess so. It's too late, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I'm trying. It's like I West really, Wing. I, really I know it's a good show, but it's 10 years worth. Oh, I don't West think Wing, I'm going to yes. watch it. Oh, no, no. Watch the West Wing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel the same way. Yeah. Oh, see, I was, yeah. That one, I'm in your camp, actually. I might get to it eventually, but there's an awful lot of seasons. It's a very big investment of my time. I haven't done it yet. Maybe I'll get to it. If someone convinces me to podcast about it, that's basically the only way it's going to happen, I think. Ooh, really? <laughs> no, I don't. Do I, I know, know. No, I don't want a podcast. So there's a very good podcast about the West Wing. I don't need to compete with them. There you go. See? Unnecessary. <laughs> so, okay. We talked about Jack's backstory. Mm. Which you didn't, you had told me you didn't know that before they gave it to you. No. One, how did you like it? And two, what was your idea of Jack's? Well, I guess you told us a little bit of Jack's backstory that he had been in the military. And- yeah. When the script arrived with Jack's backstory in it, I was delighted and it was completely in sync with my ideas for him, which I definitely kept the creators ab- abreast of. It made sense to me that he was from a, what we would a, what we would call now a sort of a you know an aspirational middle class family. Sure. Um, and it was all taken away from him. I, it made sense to me that he was probably you know one of the more educated kids in town, and that he suffered real public shame. Uh, when when his not only when his father died but when his father was alive um you know uh, he, his father was a public joke and a drunk and then and and then mm. pissed away the family business they they seem like really visceral identifiable things to me you know i come from a family mm-hmm. uh who owned small business you know my father wonderfully hasn't pissed it away you know um <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and wasn't the town drunk, but I would, you know, I can only imagine losing that at 14 and in those times. And right. and really everything that I'd made up for Jack and his backstory started a little later than that in his life. I always imagined he was either dragooned or escaped some sort of problem into the Royal Navy. Mm-hmm. And that and when they delivered that backstory, I went, well, uh-huh. that's the perfect thing to escape from. It really was. You know, for what, however he got into yes. the Navy, and this is still my own imaginings that seemed like the, the sort of the, the perfect kind of nightmare to have to skip town for mm. and it, you know the the haberdashery you know the all that makes sense that was uh-huh. a lovely way of tying into the calico um legend uh-huh. and you know i like personally like good clothes you know i'm that kind of guy <laughs> and and the sh- okay. and as, as jack came into more and more power and wealth the costume department an incredible department to work with, who always yes, listened to our department. ideas and were, you know, I was always sticking my head into really? that, into that part of the um, the studio. Just incredible seamstresses and and huh. designers and tailors from around the world. Um, uh, they were happy to listen to my ideas, and so that all fit as well. You know, he was flashy and 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 liked like fine clothes you know so yeah it was a gift to receive mm-hmm. that backstory but also the circumstances in which it unfolds mm. in a in a carriage scene with the incredible yes. luke roberts playing mm. woods rogers um so that, that becomes great. a sort uh-huh. of a stagecoach western rescue come on i mean you can do a backstory or you can do a back backstory yeah. in those environments and, uh, <laughs> bring it on mm-hmm. yeah uh, i was I was very happy when that when that backstory was delivered and I was really impressed with the what I call the big print you know like how to deliver it it was very much along the lines of don't get emotional with this hmm. this is not something that yeah. that that gets him upset publicly at least not in front of this guy right. but what I the, what no. I gathered from from the suggestions as to how to deliver that in the script were that he has moved beyond this somehow. Mm-hmm. Not entirely, but I don't feel like like with Flint's story about the man crawling out of the ocean or with mm-hmm. whatever touchiness Silver has about his past or Anne's or Max's, that it's, it's as large a problem. I suspect he has told a couple of people this story. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a war story for him. And whatever the case, in, in ah, this particular... Uh-huh 
point, he's not going to let this cat see that it's upset him. Right. Because he's actually driving right. towards a point. Right. A great the point. point is, I caught you, you, sil- you silver yes. spooner. <laughs> You know, I Uh caught up to you. And so that's a wonderful reason for having the backstory come out. He's not saying it for sympathy or or to tug on Rogers' heartstrings. He's saying, look where I came from, Sonny Jim. And um, I like that. I like the Mm -hmm. steel that was um, suggested in, in the script as to how to deliver that backstory. That was actually the thing I found most exciting about it. Oh, okay. This leads me to another question. I guess I'm, I've abandoned my structure of asking you for both, both yourself and Jack. Well, how, okay. how does Jack feel about his own backstory? <laughs> well, I think, I think I could just, just Who do, needs structure? I could just do the four page bottle log for you right now. I think that's, <laughs> yeah. We've heard how, we, we've heard how Jack feels about it. Right. No, we know how Jack feels. About it. No, <laughs> what's interesting is this leads me to another question. Cause I feel like there's, there's a question mark left in the air and we Again, we don't need to talk about season four because we're talking about one through three. So please don't sure. tell us anything. But I feel like the end, like season three, we have this kind of beautiful question mark all the time about who is Woods Rogers, which is kind of fun because we had that about Flint in the beginning, yeah. and now we have it about Woods Rogers, and those two are you know do have a lot of obvious similarities. Mm. And I feel like you know we have the whole thing where Scott basically told Maddie like learn about your enemy and she had put picked up Woods Rogers book like everyone's got his book yeah right so everyone's got his book everyone Uh thinks they know who he is and this was a scene where Jack very clearly thinks he knows who Woods Rogers is when he's talking to him and we kept talking about kind of Woods Rogers two sides like he's got the side that Jack is assuming this you know silver spoon Mm -hmm. rich boy yeah. But he's got also what we kept calling his pirate side. Yeah. So does Jack see people? Like, is that, that's what I, I guess that's where I'm going with this, yeah. with what I'm saying here is like Jack in this case is definitely has like decided who Woods Rogers is. He read his book, clearly didn't soldier through to the end, mm. but he, he has an <laughs> idea of, uh, of who Woods Rogers is. Does Jack see other people? I think it's a really good question. I think that Jack does. I think he knows that Woods Rogers is not just some uh, red coat with a couple of medals Mm -hmm. who's lived in a manor house Mm -hmm. all his life. But two things come into play there. I mean, I think Jack knows that this guy must have a pirate side. I think he's a very astute judge of of character. But knowing something... Mm doesn't mean that it isn't then instantly clouded by your own problems. Mm -hmm. And Jack has a horrible problem with authority. (laughs) And so if anyone is actually above him, Mm -hmm. I think he's insanely jealous. Right. All those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it wouldn't benefit Jack to let Woods Rogers know that he sees him clearly. Sure. It's helpful for for, for Jack to be perceived by Woods as just assuming he's a silver spooner. And I think the combination of the fact that Jack's Mm -hmm. emotions take over and goes, oh, you pretty rich boy, you're the type of guy who took my dad's business away from me, is legitimate. I do think think that Jack is smarter than that. Mm -hmm. He just lets his temper run away with him. He is like one of those Wall Street traders who lets emotion and greed Mm -hmm. and avarice completely swamp his rationality, which we've seen he has in spades in, in mm. karma moments, which is really fun to play. Right. Like, oh, is this an emotional scene or a rational scene? Right. Or is right. it go half one way, then switch, you know? Right. And uh-huh. Jack would say he's an incredible you know, um, judge of character. Uh, <laughs> un- I'm sure. Un- uh-huh. Unrivaled in the Bahamas. Right. <laughs> of course. Well, and also, <laughs> also looking like he doesn't understand Woods Rogers <clears throat> leads for to Woods Rogers possibly underestimating that's him. That's right. Exactly. Which I, I've heard is underestimation. I've heard that's yes. It's a catch cry <laughs> of his. And that happens right from the beginning, you know, of the show with Jack. Mm-hmm. And I think that the show itself gets underestimated when you first start it. And I absolutely like to think that that's definitely was sewn into the mix on purpose. Hmm. You know, we talk about oh those characters were a little bit one dimensional when we first met them. Well Everyone is when you first meet them. You only get one mm-hmm. dimension. There's nowhere to go. 
Amen you know, that. If you if you have if you see all dimensions uh-huh. to begin with, there's nowhere to go. Um, and you know, I remember mm-hmm. when Jack says in season one, at some point, once they've taken over the brothel, you know, slit many men's throats or whatever. Yeah. And there was sort of a cry from various <laughs> corners of the the burgeoning fandom at that time, going, "That guy's never slit anyone's throat," despite the fact that we've we'd seen him in a previous episode pull out his dagger and stab someone through a the wall (laughs) you know and then and then as yes yes but i understand how you watching the show first up you go oh no he's not he's all show Mm -hmm. well it's far more interesting to to Mm. to learn that of course he a dagger is his best friend and he's quite happy to slash a throat but it's much more fun to to not Uh be quite sure of that Mm -hmm. and i think that jack is well aware that being underestimated is one of his strongest weapons um and and mm. and I think that's very useful for me because I can go. Oh no, he was he he was playing that guy at that point. You know, even if you know, I'm not sure if he was or not. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure Jack Jack knows uh-huh. either. But being ambiguous is actually really easy when when you're so emotional because you go, oh, I wasn't really angry that time, mm. or I wasn't really upset. Right. You know, um, if you just sort of have a and that's the great thing about Jack. He He's very emotional and he's not afraid of screaming in public, weeping in front of his, his girl, yelling at his boss or mm-hmm. his best mate. Whereas a lot of other characters really sure. have a lot more masks up and eat eat a lot of their emotions and bury it in private, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just sure. a great gift for Jack. If you're that, If you wear that much on your sleeve, no one can really work out whether it's genuine or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. That's really interesting. Okay, sorry, I'm thinking about that now. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a kind of a get out of jail free, <laughs> but it's, you know, I think it's there's a there's a grain of truth in there. But you don't you don't feel like it's something that he's doing like with Anne, it's not something that he's doing. No. No. No, I think that the way he behaves with Anne, especially in private, is a great insight into who he is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't mind looking like a fool. Yeah. Or, or weak or emotional right. because there's always uh-huh. a way to climb out of the hole. Mm-hmm. And in fact, appearing mm. like the, you know, the odd man out or the more emotional one or the more feminine one or whatever you want to call it is a fantastic gift mm-hmm. in yeah. this very rugged, macho world. It's allowed him to survive this yeah. long. You know? I mean, it's kind of amazing that he found this route to be that person yeah. and survive like that to, yeah. to actually use that as a as a that's right as a tool that's right i think it's his main tool and i think the the other thing that's helped him survive other than dumb luck and um having charles vane as an ally is that he is okay with a blade yeah he's not as good as the other cats in the show who are all masters you know but everyone's a killer in this show mm-hmm. and he does know how to mm-hmm. wield a dagger and he does know how to how to charm his way right. into close proximity when suddenly you end up with a knife in your guts. Right. You know, he, he, he's not a complete pushover. Oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I think he loves looking like a pushover, but I think the guy knows how to, huh. you know, at least, you know, thrash his way out of a situation with a blade. And I, that's the, the great thing on this show was that the stunt guys yeah. and the, the fight guys, who were just exemplary, they all developed our fighting styles with us. And so if you're ever going back for another watch, oh, you nice. watch how, how uh, Flint has various Royal Navy moves that have been slightly corrupted. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone's got their own style. Oh. Uh, you know, they made way for the uh-huh. fact that Zach's essentially ambidextrous mm-hmm. and, and learnt on the fly. Mm-hmm. Well, what they created for Jack was that he's kind of feral and has, mm-hmm. a, has a few mm-hmm. moves that are, um, that are militarily, you know, ingrained but um, have been completely sure. corrupted. And, and I've got a long reach. I'm really long-armed. Mm-hmm. And so me with a sword, I've actually got a real uh-huh. advantage over people. This is all, you know, subtle kind of sword-fighting nerdy stuff. No, that's but, super interesting. But it's, it, it's all char- character yeah. reveal still going on in all the sword fights. Of course and, it is, um, yeah. Essentially, I think he's got a, a switch that he can throw Jack, and it's a kind of, I always imagine it as a real feral rabid dog Mm -hmm. you know like i'm gonna slash my way out of the situation Mm -hmm. one of those kind of nerds you push around in the schoolyard until they snap and you go i wish i hadn't done that this kid is now foaming at the mouth right i think that's that's what linus explains 
experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, right. that reminds me of Jack's That's first day right. in pirate captain That's school. Right. Yes. Yeah. When we were so yeah. proud of him. Yes. I was just so yeah. impressed But didn't we love day. Linus as well? And what a wonderful um, actor he was. But, I mean, that's what Black Sails does to you all yes. down the line. You kind of want them both to win somehow. Can, can Linus stick around? What a right? cool character. I know. He's, can, he's, yeah. can Jack also <laughs> win somehow? Uh, yeah, I liked yeah, that yeah. guy. I like I liked that guy. I was totally really, true. Really pleased when I saw that he was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was a beautiful. Well, and it was just it was such a great reveal yeah. too when we realized that you'd had him the whole time. It, oh, that, that was, was gorgeous. gorgeous. So much fun yeah, to watch. Yeah, you'd had him the whole time. I I'm not sure if I completely agree with that only because there was a lot of talk about it. Was I always going to cut his throat? Did mm-hmm. I make it up on the walk towards really? him? Or when I'd already sat down, am I really going to do this? Okay. I think he decides to go for the the throat slash pretty late in the piece. I don't think he knows what he's going to do. Right. But that's Jack right. again. That's the, the no, great yeah. Wall Street gambler. He doesn't know what he's going to do in an emotional way till the chips are down. Right. And he is great in the corner. He's what he's mm-hmm. going to do. Right. No, that's what we. That's what we love. Right. And it's it's. He's I mean, short-term I feel like thinker. Season three was beautiful that way. It was like when Jack had everything yes. and it should have been going well, it doesn't go well. Yeah. And then the minute he's pushed into a corner, uh-huh. yeah. that's when he gets good. Yeah. He needs to fail heaps in order to do something. <laughs> that's when he really shines. Do yes. something good. Jack is he good does, in the crisis, def- we say. Defined yeah. through loss, you know. Oh. The world's against oh, him. Oh, Jack. You know. <laughs> oh, see, I just said, oh, Jack, like mm-hmm. I always do, but I'm talking to Toby. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. No, I love it. <laughs> oh, Daphne. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's going to be a new ringtone for you, I think. So Finally, have to someone's that out sighing somehow. about me. <laughs> <laughs> my, my sighing just gives Liz glee. <laughs> the world makes sense again. Oh, my goodness. All right. What's next in your parade That's of pleasure? It. Now, now, I'm, now I'm speechless. Good. You just, you just I've got a speechless. question for God. I've got a question for you guys. I thought of it only on the way here. Like in terms of the like fantasy, fantasy uh-huh. spinoffs that you could have. Oh, Imagine that the... Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. That's... Well, thank you. You've answered my question. I'm out of here. No. Um... Like, imagine all the biggies are taken, like the early adventures of the Rangers has been done, mm-hmm. or what happens to Silver in 15 years' time, or, you know, I don't know. What's, what's the kind of obscure one that you'd love to see? Oh, goodness. I feel like we've spent so much time talking about our obscure... Yeah. We never, we never shared... We have, we have a video that I was embarrassed to share with you that we, uh, that we had for just our patrons... Gotcha. And you were talking through some of this stuff? Oh. Okay, I'm going to do that. All right, so this has already maybe been covered. Yeah, I was going to say, what were you embarrassed about? <laughs> you know what I was embarrassed about. I'll tell you later. Oh, oh, of course. That's fine, though. I'd like to see, I'd like to see Featherstone stumble on a time machine and become a sort of a grumpy, <laughs> alcoholic, private eye in sort of 1920s Berlin. Now that okay. is obscure. You're yeah. way better yeah, yeah. than we are. <laughs> just so, I had four years to think about it. What? Just sort of just solving cases in, in Weimar. Okay, well, when you kick Weimar, the door Berlin. open that wide. I mean, you just totally beat Lauren with her bed and breakfast with uh-huh. Featherstone and oh, Adele. Right. Done. I'll watch that. <laughs> Sorry, I'll watch Lauren. that. I'll watch Sorry, that. Sorry, Lauren, that's out the door. Yeah. We like Toby's. <laughs> mm. That's it. And not, maybe not even speaking German, uh... just somehow in Berlin in the 20s, Featherstone just having to deal with that. That'd be really funny. <laughs> I pretty much would like to see Featherstone deal with any weird situation right. that he doesn't know how to deal with. But yes, now that you've opened that up. A shout mm-hmm. out to the magnificent Craig Jackson as well, who plays oh. uh, Featherstone. And a great thing that happened as well when we uh-huh. met each other and they wrote that part and then extended it, seeing you know how well he was doing, um, is that it took some of the responsibility off, off me for providing levity. Mm-hmm. You know, and as Jack becomes a more, you know, in quotation marks, serious character as the show goes on, was largely um, made able because Craig could take on some of the comedy, you know. And then, of course, then he takes on his own dramatic dimension as well. Sure. As things get passed yeah. on. But um, I, yeah. I had such a lovely time working with Craig and we, and we got each other instantly and, um, and we have some fun in four. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Little hint. Um, yes. No, you two are fabulous together. Cheers. I really, really enjoyed 
Jack and Featherstone yeah. pretty much from the beginning. He's like, so just like from the like, sure. you know, I never He's worked so with mean captain, to him. So I, I know. He does not give him a break. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, well, like, um, yeah, they're they're so kind of true. an odd couple. Like it's yeah. really quite it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. The first line where mm-hmm. I really paid, started paying attention to the dynamic was the like I've never worked with a captain so particular. Yeah, which also happens to be one of my favorite scenes. Thank you. There's a tiny moment right when Featherstone is first mentioned. Um, I can't remember if it's Adele or Max, you know, who says, you know, I'm about to get some information out of Featherstone. Right. And the other one says, oh, he's one of the sort of you know best navigators. In the Bahamas, okay. and there's a mo- okay. and there's a mo- but there's a moment just before Jack says he's okay, where you see Jack know he is. Jack goes, yeah, he fucking is. That's gonna be great. And then Jack can't help himself. He says he's okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Now I want to watch that. Again. Yeah, watch there's that again. there's the ego <laughs> gnawing away again. Okay, all right. If we're going scene by scene mm. now, you have to talk to us about the seduction scene. The seductions of which one? They're all seductions. No, no, the one Jack. where Max is explaining to Adele yeah, it, oh. about seduction. You know what? That's one of oh, that's one yes, of Zach's yes. favorite scenes of oh, mine. Oh, it's a fantastic he, he scene. Said, yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure why I never thought that it was an amazing scene. I'm talking purely from a selfish my perspective, but Zach was banged on about mm-hmm. it all the time. Man, I love that scene. That's so cool. With that listening you're doing, <laughs> you just seemed so uncomfortable, and well, it was just so beautiful. I think it's I think it's another um, paving stone in the long path of Max Jack. And sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. From the very beginning, he says, you are very attractive. Um, and I'm very wary of you. And mm-hmm. she says, the things you could learn in my bed. <laughs> and the fact that he loses a partner to her, yep. ostensibly, um, at least sexually, he definitely does. And this is nearly every scene they're in together. There's a denial from Jack about certain things, certain attractions. Mm-hmm. He has to voice it in order to right. sort of exorcise it. And then finally when he is yes, in yeah. bed with her, and I really hats off to this show for treating that menage a trois so artistically. It could have so been all sorts of done. things, but wasn't it a beautiful yes. scene? And I love how it wasn't like starting out. There was like, there were three acts in mm-hmm. to that sex scene. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. It was Dawn had, like Jack says, we've lost track of time. It was mm-hmm. sweaty mm-hmm. and got a bit weird. <laughs> it got a bit like, weird. Like the drugs had worn off and like, Christ, we still got this thing. And then, <laughs> and then right on the buzzer, you know, there is a connection between Jack and Max. Mm-hmm. And she right. seems as startled as him in a way. Mm-hmm. Maybe not quite as, but there's surprise in her that this thing we promised ourselves would never happen in a way. Um, or at least bantered about would never happen, has happened. What does this mean? And it's very human. But yes, I think that mm-hmm. uh, the seduction scene, Max talking about how someone, how a woman in her position, or maybe how all women seduce, <laughs> um, if, if uh-huh. you, you know, maybe that's what Max is saying. It's, it's wonderfully ambiguous. Yep. Um, is is very disturbing to Jack. Mm-hmm. You know, it was uh, it was it was an eye opener for him. But he, of course, can't help but <laughs> see Max. Right. You know, that's what's what, disturbing really, for him. Really, you know? can anyone help but see no, Max? No, well, that's true. <laughs> but that's well established and, and subtly established and I think established in a sophisticated way mm-hmm. that Max has real power Absolutely. in the bed. And that, that pirate, you know, I think he's an unnamed pirate in the first season who's describing what happened to him. Yes, like yes, yes. The one who's, like, trying to convince the other ones. Yeah, yeah. he's become a, a more mature man yeah. with a more understanding about yeah. femininity. Yep. It's not just, oh, I had a great route. My mind has been blown about right. the possibilities of humankind because yep. I spent half an hour with Max, no last name, you know? <laughs> and so she has a real power that, that Jack is aware of. And so I think that seduction scene is a, a great twist in that particular time. I mean, it's it's one of those scenes that I love about Black Sails because it's fun for itself. Yeah. Because it's hilarious. That's right. Like, it's completely hilarious where, you know, Adele's like, wait, but I still fuck his brains out. Yeah, oblivious to all So, right. right. So, yes. that, that's, yes. <laughs> so it's hilarious on that level. It's I certainly, know. I think, especially amusing to women because there is that thing yeah. where, like, men are often... Yeah. clueless about certain things yeah. and it's really an important scene like you said like it's a very important Jack and Max scene yeah. she knows he's listening 
Well, of course. Yeah. And yeah. So she, she's performing mm-hmm. always. That's she's right. always performing. Yeah. And that's a real secret trick of the trade she's letting him in on. I'm only thinking of this now, but mm-hmm. I mean, you could say that she's seducing him or trying to make him uncomfortable or yep. just as equally perhaps going, this is how this place works, Buster. Right. If you exactly. really want to be a uh, top right. dog, dog here, wise up. Well, and this was right when they had a whole conversation about whether or not she's indispensable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, also true, right. yeah. No, this is one of my favorite things about Max. Um, you may have understood that Max yeah. is also yeah, one of my favorite characters. She's a queen. <laughs> I love how Max is always doing multiple things at the same time, yeah. but generally without malice. I mean, this is what I love about Max in mm-hmm. relation to other characters who are smart and devious, is that She's usually trying to like make as many people happy as possible. Yeah, it was interesting what Andrew was saying on your last pod about uh, you know, whatever the co- historical quote he'd found about um, people who want to change the world mm-hmm. uh, never or rarely are doing it uh, for the people, are doing it for themselves. And all these sort of maxims and truisms, of course, have their opposite and, you know, the exception that breaks the rule. But it made me start thinking about the characters in this show who don't want to change the world. And I wondered about Billy and I wondered about Max. Right. Like they're not trying to impose some yep. new world order or have a statu- right. statue of them on the top yeah. of St. Paul's Cathedral like Jack might or whatever. Right. Or I mean, Anne. Yeah. It's not trying to change the world. Like, are they really just looking like for a fireplace, some security? I suspect Max wants a little more than than to go to a place where no one's seen the ocean and just... Right. Live with a nice yeah, she's library. Not, she's, like, yeah, yeah, she's not quite right. like yeah. she's not quite the more no. shovel. And person. I suspect you know Flint actually or, or McGraw wants more than what he says. You yeah, know? that the that great thing about, about uh-huh. James, I've never been able to forget, is in season two when it's revealed that before the earliest incarnation of Dimples that we meet, he has uh-huh. a dark side. Right. You know, right, 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 absolutely. No, yeah. I love that. Then you guys were talking last week about in the cage when he finally might, part of him, even subconsciously accept that mm-hmm. he's not going to get out of this alive. Was there always a part of him that was that self-destructive? Yeah. We don't I know. Think, I think there was. Yeah. That's my belief. Right. But, you know, Max may say that she just wants what she saw peering through that window. Does she want a little bit more? Right. Not kind of queen of the world. Yeah, right? But sure. maybe not quite just the opposite of that, just right. a little house and hearth and a dog and a doting husband. Maybe somewhere in between. Maybe that's right. what they're all chasing. <laughs> um, sure, oh, that's interesting. Sure, I, like I that. mean, I think that's part of Max's development because I think in the beginning we see her wanting to just run away and be happy with Eleanor. I mean, I think it's clear. It's not clear what Eleanor wants no. at that point, but it's no. clear what Max wants. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. And that's I think that... Definitely, definitely developing, yeah. but it's always complex. Right. And Max already mm-hmm. had the capabilities to read a situation and make the best of it, obviously, because yeah. she does that in the first episode. Mm-hmm. But I think that it seems like with Max that as she gets more power, she does get a taste for it. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, that's very human too, though, to have this simple goal or this ideal set up. And then when you reach it, find that satisfaction isn't there after all. And and find that things are only shiny for that 24 to 48 hours. And then there's this longing for something that's more and something that's other. And I don't think that we ever quite arrive. Yeah. It is interesting then to divide those characters because, I mean, Anne... You'll will have to excuse me because like the past week all I've done is think about Anne. Yeah. Um, so oh, it's very easy for you. So. To do it, right? <laughs> I was going to say not a bad week. Not a bad week at all. But mm-hmm. I I've lately been focusing more on Anne, and I feel like Anne perhaps is our only character who isn't that person. Yeah. And so I'm really curious. I mean, she's an incredible half formed yeah. enigma. She, she more than any other character in the show, in my mm-hmm. eyes, needs someone else. Right. She, I don't think she even wants to stand out alone. No, it doesn't seem you like know, it at all. Where she is her right. truest self, I think, and is enjoying her own power the most, even more than Charles, is in battle. Mm-hmm. She's not just uh, hold, holding uh-huh. it amongst the boys. She's holding it amongst every warrior that you can imagine mm. around that part of the equator. She's true... And she's powerful and she's turned on and alive Mm -hmm. and clear-eyed and has no doubts, you know. I remember Clara once saying very early in the shooting, and she stuck to her guns through the whole shoot, 
She said, I don't see it as psychopathic. I don't see it as damaged. But I think that Anne enjoys watching them die when she kills them. Huh. She wants to see them slump. She wants to right. see the blood leak out of them. She likes seeing their breath stop. Huh. I was like, wow, that's dark. And she goes, well, you can see it as dark. I just... In a really non non theoretical non non psychological sure way, I see she just that said, as dark. Actually, yeah, yeah, I see that as more like living in the moment. Like yeah. that is the thing, and that really really visceral. Exactly, and it's about feelings right. and touch and, and things you can't even really put in. I words. mean, it's it's like the way someone else huh. would really enjoy like a great glass of scotch and yeah. watching the sunset. That's like, right. It's She's like... a connoisseur of death. An artist. I guess I've been thinking a lot, perhaps because we were about to talk to you. I've been thinking a lot about about Anne and Jack together and a lot about season three. And I always go back to that cave where Jack, yeah. where Jack just isn't happy. Right. And then mm-hmm. Jack decides to go back and try to get his pardon. Yes. And Anne was possibly the most reasonable person we've seen in mm-hmm. all of the three seasons mm-hmm. where she's like, wait a minute, we've got this, we've got this chest we can just get the hell out of here and go have a nice life right now. And, and what an open young woman she was in that cave with Max mm-hmm. as well. Right? Oh my God. Oh no, we have that scene. I love that scene a lot. Oh, yeah. I just, I've just started to realize like that Anne, I'm really curious what's going to happen with Anne in season four. I just feel like Anne, it's been a bit under the radar, but that Anne's arc is actually pretty incredible that we start out having her not really be much of anything and then she goes through this crisis and then she comes out the other side of this crisis I feel like knowing a lot more I mean she asks who am I and I feel like she comes out of it knowing possibly more than most of the characters who she is and who she is is just really different to a whole lot of these sort of big swinging dicks exactly just happy to be who she discovered is right exactly quite self-satisfied but she's right is that she's tied to these two people with very not different. I mean, it's far they, more ambitious. I feel right. Both are ambitious. Yeah. Different ambition. I mean, I feel like Jack and Max have very different ambition. And I just, I feel for Anne right now. Like it's just like she's like, can't we just go right. she somewhere? Could have had a more, more of an Eliza <laughs> Doolittle experience. Right. She's been snapped up as a, a flower seller on a corner in London. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I just feel like I want, I want Anne's vision. I want Jack and Anne to like go off, like go to Europe and drink champagne and, and you know, spend their money. Oh, Anne would be terrible. I mean, yeah, she would. Okay, fine. All right, it's fine. true. She All would right. be. It's great. Yeah. It's ideal. It's true. Because she right. would just get, need, she would need to start killing people again. <laughs> right. Mercenary on the side, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's so true. Okay, fine. <laughs> ruin, ruin my little dream for Jack and Anne. It's all right. No, she's, a, she's an intriguing character, and I think that intriguing and slightly unknowable really works for her like it does with Silver. Right, yeah. and so different from each other, too. Yeah. I have moments where I like watch it specifically for a character, and I yeah. feel like right now I've been watching it for Anne. Yeah. And mm. I'm intrigued. I mean, really another, intrigued. another for what it's worth, I found it very interesting. Clara comes at her acting and definitely at the role of Anne, from a very visual way, hmm. how her hat is, how her mm-hmm. hair is, how Absolutely. her shoulders yes, are yes. placed, what she's chewing in her mouth, where the streak hmm. of grime is, is paramount to her. And then there's a whole lot of great acting that goes on after that, of mm-hmm. course. But mm-hmm. it is, you know, if she was definitely cast in a role that has a manga shape to it. It's low on the dialogue uh, as uh-huh. start, you mm-hmm. know. That appearance is mm-hmm. all, you know. Who is this shady, unknowable person? Am I am I uh, attracted? Am I repulsed? Am mm-hmm. I scared? Um, am I seduced? And that never stopped with Clara, and that's how she thinks. She says she's a, uh, an artist, she's a visual painter, her, her papa's one. You know, um, she comes from a very visual oh, world, and that uh-huh. was just wonderful to work with. Any actor who brings a new mm-hmm. flavor to the way you can think about a role is great. Right, from a different perspective. Yeah, and, and Clara created an incredible character, and she didn't just follow what was on the page. She mm-hmm. created that, mm-hmm. that incredible Anne Bonny. It will always be Anne Bonny for me in my head. Yeah, I was thinking how much that changed just from her her facial expressions and that constant grimace and sneer she had in season one and how she softens so much to where it seems almost like a different actress. It seems like a new person. That's right. She either loses 
the mask or replaces it with a with a yes. new one. She doesn't feel the need to be that person to hide so much behind right. something anymore. You know? No, and in three ten, I mean three ten's just an incredible episode. Well, for both of you. Well, we talked about the loss of the hat when she stopped being obscured by the hat. Right. Yeah. The the fact that she's not wearing the hat or the coat yeah. and. I mean, I said this in the podcast. I mean, I think one of the most beautiful things is, again, that that I think that I declared that my favorite thing, didn't I? With it from that episode, I declared the you've point got a, that, a million favorite yes. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm talking. I'm talking to the man who created all of my favorite things practically in the show. Um, but uh-huh. one of my favorite things from that episode is when Jack and Anne part. And they have the beautiful see you on the other side always. And she's so, she reaches a level of emotion in her face that is the kind we expect generally from from Jack. And then she immediately goes into warrior mode. And just, we talked a lot about it. And Jack, um, alternatively, has to be more more Anne in his response. Mm -hmm. Of course, stop being so emotional. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Always. You know, they, when everyone's doing one thing, the other one has to even it out Mm -hmm. by doing the other. We talked a lot about that hmm. that moment. Always, that's their actual thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, it's their little catch cry, and we decided yeah. that she should be a little more needy than him in this particular moment. You know, that he's going to say, "Yeah, it's all going to be fine," despite being scared witless that he's right. it's his turn to be tough. That's what we do right. in relationships. No, that's beautiful. Oh, that's yeah, that's good. really beautiful. Mm. So you say that uh, Anne is most herself, is most vibrant and alive and fully realized when she is in battle. That's what, what I would see you when say... I watch the show. Yeah. Yeah. What What would you say then? Um, is Is Jack's then? Is Is his moment where he is is most himself? I think when he's right out on the edge of anti-authoritarian wheeling and dealing. Hmm. You know, I think you see it early on with his scene with Gates when he's baiting him emotionally about being an old oh, man. I know, that I killed me. He's, that. He's, it's really kind of out there right. um, tactics. Mm-hmm. When he does the same with Mapleton, mm-hmm. he basically says, I'm lying and you know I'm lying. Do you want to come on board? I love that. That's some bold. Uh- <laughs> Stop, broker, brass balls. Go yeah, on, you you see it. You see it actually time and time again with Jack, and I think that's when he feels the most alive. I think he's addicted to that kind of balls. Oh, sure. I can't believe you're actually putting this on the table. Um, mm. I think he likes a long shot, and yeah. it could be argued yeah. a few characters in this yeah. this show that they bet on a long shot. But mm-hmm. I'm not sure they like betting on long shots. No. I think they do it because they've already. Oh, I think sure. He lives for it. You know, with Linus, uh, you know, often you just see him go with Woods Rogers in the, right, in the last yeah. season. He should be in that office. He's a dangerous person. He should really be in there, kind <laughs> right. of sucking up to him. Yeah, absolutely. He could have, if he played his cards right, he could feasibly have had a red coat uniform 48 hours later and absolutely. still do what he wanted. Absolutely. I mean, that's what Rogers himself. obviously wanted. Yeah. Good call, he but he can't help himself. No, himself. he could. He would I mean, far like, rather do the thing that right. Rogers wasn't expecting just to see the look on no, his face. No, he was being an ass before he even realized what <laughs> Rogers was offering him. Yeah. He's addicted to being the kid at the back of the class with a yeah. smart comment. I think. Oh, oh yes. And then course. still seeing if he can get a way out on top. On, on top. You know? Uh huh. That's right. And and yet still be top of the class. But I think uh-huh. that's where he comes alive. Uh, where he feels the best. Wow. So he's. Mm-hmm. I, I would say he's probably the only character that. It, I mean, I feel like everyone else is really fighting against that. Everyone else is trying to create situations where they can control. Yeah. There's a, there's an anarchic streak to Jack. Right. And I think Chaz liked it. I think uh-huh. Anne likes it right. in him. No, that makes so much sense yeah. why the two of them would be attracted it appe- to that. Yeah, those two punks um, find him appealing, I think, because of that. The, the, right. the smarts and the charm, sort of, but there's a lot of people with that. I think it's the fact that at the end of the day, he's quite happy to a, a dagger into someone you didn't think he was going to. Right. Or flip the tables completely. Uh-huh. And yet, like, shuffle right. and scrape to try to get someone like Blackbeard to yes. to even recognize him. That's and that's right. probably why he resents it. Yeah. It's probably why he's such, he just wants to say fuck you to authority. Because really, he just wants more than anything for yeah. people like Blackbeard to actually. I think you've got it. You know, I right. think people who, you know, who hate something, Aww. you know, have their reasons. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yes. You know. 
on. It's, just, right. it's, it's just a thing so he can sad. never have. Right. Yeah. He'll but never then, have that that like deep down inside of your bones authority like yeah. someone like Blackbeard. Thank right. goodness to be a boring story. Or that he's you know, was like a sort of a successful tailor in Leeds. Right. I don't want to see that show. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If you're playing that guy, I might want to still see that show. <laughs> Not watch. <laughs> Be like the paradise sort yeah, of. Yes. I don't know, just like you know, the smart Alec Taylor. I could tell. I I could watch you do that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. There you go. Dutch brain. <laughs> Glee, glee, glee. Laugh number three. There we go. Right. So, do we give away that I'm actually sitting next to Toby because a lot of people would be very amused by that? There we go. I think it's I think it's the store of the hour myself. <laughs> no, it's just funny because I think it was like early on in the show, in our show, that I actually said like my dream would be to, to like sit around drinking with Jack. Not that I'm sitting around drinking with Jack. I'm sitting around drinking with Toby. Well, you sort of are. That's true. So, uh, yeah, well, they asked. It, it was it was the the game that they asked. That's that's the part I assume was going to embarrass you about the video yeah, was the yeah, yeah. Yeah, drinking buddy. What was it, Mary? Somebody wanted to. Buddy. Some, I'll, I'll just tell you, even though I'm sitting next to you, right. even though I was embarrassed to send you the video. Yeah, somebody said uh, they wanted us to play. What is the game? Fuck, marry, drink. Yes. Okay. Right. So I guess, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But they, yeah. Through, something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, 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 right. Right. So I, you, who did you pick? I don't remember. Billy. Uh, Mary Billy, obviously. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's really the only marriageable person Obviously. in the show, in my opinion. Yep. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Screw, I think, was vain, actually. Yeah, I think it was. And uh, and drinking buddy was definitely Rackham for sure. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. No doubts. I right. mean, obviously. So I said marry right? marry Jack, drink with Jack, because everyone should want their marriage partner as their drinking buddy. Cool. Which is. Pretty good advice, I thought. I was like, actually, that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> As for the next time. Screw Joshua. Oh, no. Oh, God. Max. Yeah. <laughs> okay. right. so. That's why I was amused. I was like, oh, shit. That, I just made myself into Anne. I love it. I'm no, so that's... not Anne. I'm definitely not Anne. The drinking thing is interesting. I mean, you know, historically for whatever it is whatever it means, what we know about pirate history, but apparently, you know, Rackham was drunk when his ship was finally taken over. And oh. any, any chance that I had in the show to, to portray him drinking, I took. Oh. If there was a glass or a bottle on the show. Sure. Such good gifts. Thank you for that. Gleevy, gleevy, yeah. <laughs> it is. We do like the drinking gifts. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> any chance I, I had to make Jack have oh, a that's so interesting. the wrist, I, I grabbed it, yeah. I like that. I guess I stopped reading the pirate book. I like didn't get to the ends of everyone, which sure. might be good. Like I started reading. Well, who knows if it's true? That, yeah. You know, but apparently he was down below drunk when when the piece right. was right. No, started. and that makes sense because Lauren told us that Anne and mm-hmm. in historical Anne had not such nice things to say yeah. to him. Yeah, that's right. So that totally makes and sense. Then disappeared into the, the ah, mists right. of time. Yes. I mean, it's all pretty dubious mm. stuff. I used to have a history lecturer at university who taught, you know, 20th century European history. And he was saying, you know, ancient and any history up until, you know, sort of you know, the 1800s is essentially, you know, untrue because no one wrote it down properly. Right. There's, no, there's no checks and right. balances. Right, right, no right, one's right. writing footnotes, <laughs> you know. It was uh, good storytelling. It was good storytelling, especially, I mean, Christ, right? you know, these stories had to get out of the Bahamas and get their way back to the the emerging Fleet Street press, which was looking for anything sensational right. to, to shift some units. Sure, you know, sure. It's very hard to fact check on that stuff. Um, what we do know is that these people called these names did exist and, and were living outside right. the law, and it's a great jumping off. No, they're very good stories. And then became... My eyes, a much better story. Sure. Now, now definitively canon. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I don't really need any other pirate story. But the, any story that's um, as well told, I think, as, as as this particular show is, is always open for interpretation. I loved hearing your last cast talking about, you know, Dufresne carrying the weight of Billy's tricking him mm-hmm. into storming that ship. I'd never thought of that before. Mm. And now that is kind oh. of canon for me. Oh. You know, those kind of oh. things. Oh, wow. like, the more mm-hmm. insight, the better on a, mm-hmm. on a good show. Um, yes. 
Well, in this show, I mean, not all television shows, I think, invite this level of analysis and have this many options. Certainly. How you could see sure. a certain situation. You know, Andrew said last week, you have to continue talking intelligently about something you love. You know, I think that's, that's great. It's really good. I think one of the things that is often uh, skipped over with analysis of this show is that the boy's own adventure... Robert Louis Stevenson angle is kind of vital to mm -hmm. it. And yes, there was a lot more of it at the head, but I think it was very important to help shoehorn mm -hmm. an audience into seeing something grittier, darker, more sophisticated. And it's not like it, it was completely erad oh. eradicated. Mm -hmm. There's still wonderful cliffhangers mm -hmm. at the end of each episode, yeah, which uh -huh. is a complete tip of the hat to serial, you know, adventure storytelling. I remember sure, the, uh, sure. The, is it the first season where they board the Spanish galleon, uh, Flint and Silver? That's the, that's the first episode of the second, second season. season. Yeah. I remember loving that sequence. Yes, great. And then hearing that, you know, the writer's room had a bit of back and forth about the legitimacy of such a kind of um, a Spielbergy sequence, for want of a better word. And... I think oh, that, interesting. You know, and you watch it, and it's great. The tension is high. Like, I totally believe mm -hmm. it. But it is the rolling bottle. It's the grabbing yeah. of the whistle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Absolutely. the, you know, it's told in a real boys' own adventure kind of Absolutely. way. But the show holds all that. It needs all of it. And it's not like that stuff does, disappears yeah. completely. I think the balancing no. of those kind of different styles, and it's not just two, it's not just gritty the wire but with pirates mm -hmm. or deadwood versus shiny um boys own there's all gradients between but i think that yeah, balance yeah. is really important and we may love one style more than the other but it wouldn't be the show it is without without both components i think yeah so, yeah. yeah no it's totally true i mean it's talking to liz like this podcasting has been interesting for me because i uh, think everyone knows that i have a special love for sadness and tragedy the horror though. yeah no i and it's funny i have a lovely life and i'm an optimist it's just funny that i love this so much in storytelling yeah, too. but great tragedies always have gags in them Hamlet's right riddled exactly with them. no no totally and the great comedy yes are basically yes and it's in, so in important human tragedy right well and it makes it more human yeah. because yeah. i mean that that is yes that is what we all that yeah. is our lives yeah. Time will be. Uh, I think history will be very kind to this. Yeah, show. There I isn't think so another. Too. There isn't I another so pirate show out there, right? And you know, yeah. I think mm -hmm. there's there's a whole lot of little boys and girls now who are, you know, only only ankle high. Who are at some point their parents are going to go. Do you want to watch a pirate show? Well, but yeah, I think this show this show is so different from really anything that came before. I mean, I just I just can't really. I know that. The creators have shows that they that they compare it to. To be honest, um, I think that they're being overly modest, and I think that they don't quite get how amazing their own show yeah. is. But um, I think that in the long run, this show is really going to stand out as as something truly special and and kind of revolutionary. Like I'm just curious what shows will come from this. I like what John said about jumping in with both feet about being complex in mm -hmm. the storytelling mm -hmm. then realising uh -huh. crumbs we've really got a job ahead of us now yeah. but I suppose <laughs> we have to keep going with it yeah. and you know I think uh -huh. some of that early ambition let alone marrying Robert Louis Stevenson yeah. is something grittier for stars you know sure. boy oh boy sure. what, what, what a whiteboard they must have had in their writers room mm -hmm. with objectives to complete and yet I think they did it and uh, I agree. I think history will be very kind to it. Boy, it was a blast being part of it. Um, you know, it was, it was a real thrill. And and as you guys have talked about before, and as the show makes clear, it's a story about storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yes, we love that. That's always going to be a winner. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's why Hamlet has a play within the play. Absolutely. That particular device, that particular metaphor will always chime through the ages. And yes, maybe another pirate mm -hmm. TV show will come along, but not soon. They're too expensive to make. Right. <laughs> well, and it's not about pirates. I mean, I think, right. I think yeah. what's fascinating about this show, I mean, and in the time that it happened, you know, so this is you know, whatever number of years, depending on when you decide the golden age of television is, yeah. it's whatever number of years into that. But um, I feel like it's the first show that truly is one unit. 
that it really is one story and yet ep- still has an episodic uh-huh. aspect to it, but uh-huh. that it is really feels like one story. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of other television shows approached that and played with that idea, but that I feel like this show has is more that than any other show. Yeah. Um, I also think that the the beautiful marriage of darkness and light. I mean, I really think that um, yes, that, yes, that it really, really found the perfect note that does feel truly human. That is is can be experienced mm-hmm. on many levels. Can be experienced just as like a, a fun pirate romp, or can be you know. <laughs> delved into yeah. possibly more than seems normal for a person. Yeah. <laughs> no, it keeps giving. Right. <laughs> it is sophisticated storytelling. Right. It does keep really giving. Right. Yeah. And yet it's its own, its own beast with mm. a beginning and an end. Absolutely. And, um... Well, we don't know the end yet, but yes. <laughs> we <laughs> assume. Right. But I am so grateful for that too. Yeah, that it ends when it's supposed to end. It doesn't just keep trickling forward and and with new spins and spin-offs so I'm, I'm very pleased that it was told as a complete story and i don't think i've ever gone into a final season of a television show so trusting that i know it's yes. gonna feel right at the end yeah. like i've never yeah. honestly never ever ever have gone in sure. feeling that and i i have no doubt of that i'm very curious no doubt yeah what that's mm-hmm. going to be and where the characters are going to go and what that's going to mean for their arcs and what it's going to mean for the world view as a whole yeah. It's not Featherstone discovering a time machine. Oh, Sorry, oh, Brian. See, now you're, Brian you you are about that. <laughs> oh wait, listen, I, we didn't we didn't say our like. Yeah. I, I don't know. Toby Toby raised the bar so oh. much. I feel like it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I need some time. No, to I don't mind that. Do you have yours? No. Okay. You if you have yours, go for it. I, I thought of mine. Yes, because I'm, I'm a period dramas girl. So I'm thinking because I love Abigail Ash so much. I want Abigail Ash during the American Revolution just being like an abolitionist and leading like the women's just being a badass in general, maybe running a hospital for soldiers or doing whatever she does. Just yes. I kind of want Abigail Ash to be Eliza Hamilton. That's really cool. That's but like basically kind of there, what I want. Yeah. Kind of there in the trenches, <laughs> running messages out to ships. Oh, I love the, that. Oh, oh, no. Now you two have yeah, put me in a yeah. position where it's I need really to come up with good. something really good. You're allowed to take your time. I'm taking my time. That's true. It doesn't have to be tonight. You can tack it on and edit it in and sound like you just came off the cuff. It's a little a little bit unfair because I'm sitting here with two writers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a really, really, really good reader, watcher, sure. whatever, but I sure. happen to be sitting here There's with two writers. Nothing to be ashamed about homework. <laughs> a bit of prep. That's a long way. Sometimes, as, yes, I, yes. as I've listened to your guys' podcast, you guys have gone, I don't quite buy that, or uh-huh. I'm not sure about that. Now, of course, I can't think of any of those moments. Do you have any of them that you that you might that I might be able to shed light on? I go, no, that was genuinely wow, you know, I how to how to pick that right. apart, or that didn't come across. I or... don't know if we have any of those for Jack. Do you have any of those for Jack? Uh, well, what I was going to ask earlier about, I, and I think it was it was somewhat answered, mm. but just um but it was about jack and blackbeard and why he wants and needs his approval it seems strange to me at this point of jack's arc or it did at the time like i had trouble understanding i think that it is what it appears to be liz i think that when we started the show we for ease of reference, we kind of cast everyone as rock stars. You know, we thought, what if the Rangers were like, sure, like, sure. like the Kinks and like the Warriors crew was like <laughs> the Stone, sure, and and like maybe you know Avery and and uh, Benji Hornigold were sort of Beatles who'd like Beatles, kind of gone. yeah, of course. And I think that Blackbeard, when he walks into that saloon, is kind of like a Mozart. Or something where Jack oh. actually, I think, is what you see when you see Jack kowtowing and being yeah. so needy uh, in front of Blackbeard. I think what's happening there is the, is the truth. I think he can't stop himself. I think he a, a true, I like rock, that. A true rock star himself. in his universe has, has you know suddenly appeared before him, and I think that also he thinks mm-hmm. he has things mm-hmm. to say that Blackbeard will be impressed by. Look what I've done with the place. It comes as a terrible, 
terrible, sobering shock to flashy Jack that right. you know, nothing could impress, um, teach less than what Jack's done with the place. Um, so, yeah, I don't uh, think there's anything too hidden mm-hmm. or complex about that. I think, um, you know, in comes, in comes teach and Jack goes a little bit to water. <laughs> a little, um, te- I do like that, Teacher though. mania, yeah. So wait a minute. Is, <laughs> does that make Jack Ray Davies or Dave Davies? D- yeah, Dave, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, and then who is Ray Davies? Oh, I was always shifting the, the analysis of her. That'd be sad. That'd be, be Charles, I think. Probably. You think of Charles? Yeah, probably. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. But in terms of like the range, I think were the kind of the cool hip ones who hadn't done too many singles comparatively. You know, hadn't shifted as many units, but were cool to like. You know, slightly badder boys, slightly racier lyrics. That was, <laughs> I think we equated it. With. That's it. It was, was now, four years ago. I will yeah. now forever see the Ranger crew as the Kings, yeah. and I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> we need more fan art of that, I think. Uh huh. Yes. All right, listeners, we put you on. We put you mm-hmm. on that task now. Ranger crew as the Kinks. Yeah. You like to sketch, Toby? Yeah, I doodle. I doodle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've got to say, while well, I have the chance, thanks you two for all your work on the the seasons and oh. the unfolding season to come. Like it's been really cool to listen to people talk intelligently about the show with love, but also as a platform for other people to join in. That's yeah. so cool hearing yeah. other people's opinions that I wouldn't have been able to hear without this particular portal. And you know, I'm a bit mm. of a bit of a Luddite technophobe. I didn't know that such a thing was possible really until, you know, I was there sweating on a treadmill in Cape Town and decided to have a listen to this thing and it's great. Now I listen to all sorts of podcasts. I sound 80. Oh, that's months. great. Yeah. No, so, um, yeah, well done. Fantastic. Well done, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I think Jack Rackham just called us proper pirates. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yay. Proper podcasters. Proper podcasters. Proper podcasters. We're doing our best. Oh, but yeah, we, we, do have, we do have a terrific community. And it's been really fun for us because you. people... So intelligent. Yes. Yeah. We have learned so much. And there's really mm-hmm. not a greater gift than to learn new angles on a story Right. From things so, much. so outside our ken. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. From the art history majors who, who have come in with things that we didn't understand yeah. Yeah. grasp of Greek mythology. Philosophy. Naval, yeah. naval Philosophy, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. No, it's incredible. Pirate history. Mm-hmm. People yeah. who yeah. really know pirate history. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I know nothing, so that's been illuminating. After yeah. four years, she's learned not a thing. Fantastic. But I'm glad. <laughs> Glad the show has bypassed you completely. Well, I don't know what's the show and what's, you know, they don't say underneath it based on actual events whenever somebody pops up. Oh, also, this guy's real. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I, I learned some ship stuff. I learned about to gallants. And... Right. <laughs> to yeah, I, know the word. I know the word to yes, gallants right. now. It's got an apostrophe. Sure. That's what I learned. It's got an apostrophe. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Now I've just got to get on a ship. That's yeah, right. that's thank, the thing. I'm thank, so landlocked. Thank the fates. Jack never had to climb to the Tagalots. Yeah. Yeah. Really? yeah pretty oh, I would have liked that. to see that, though. That's right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, now we know that that doesn't happen. In I, might, I might make it to the foxhole or the, the mid-mast or mid somebody Now I can, I can reveal to you now that Mid-mast? he never quite makes it to the uh-huh. Yeah. This is not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. mm. Somebody wants to watch that. It takes two hours. <laughs> come on, Jack. Just put your foot on the. Come on. Just someone give him a. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess I guess the the spin off show that I want more than anything. I think I've said this actually already. So now I'm not being very original. And again, not quite as good as you all, but You're really quite all right. Really, the thing I want more of so much more of is Jack and Teach. That's just my favorite thing. Sure, thing. sure. Yeah, having to work to, if they could just stand each other, they might just, just stand a chance. Just, yeah. I just, I yeah. just, <laughs> we've, we've got some. Yeah, sure. And now I see it as like, 
a rom-com basically <laughs> or maybe actually maybe i want like jack and teach and flint like pretty much doing anything so that's the two oh. of them like so jack that's a just, totally like, different show sure. it is a different show but it was like where just jack can like play. decide in different at different times like which one of them <laughs> he wants to impress and both of them are not that's impressed right. He does fanboy oh, geek. Dear. He does fanboy geek out a bit with Flint. I mean, yeah. this is right, right, Davies. You know, meeting with Jagger. It's um. Sure, sure. It's a bit of that. Uh, <laughs> well, you've seen you've seen from the the teaser clips for season four. That, I don't think Liz has seen even uh, that. Gotcha. Liz has stayed pure. I don't like well, that done. kind of thing. Well That's done, right. Okay, I'm no. a virgin. Then I'm gonna then I'm going to shush up. But um, you know, <laughs> there is the there is a possibility that you'll see uh, some teaching. Jack stuff. <laughs> well, I do like possibilities. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Even virgins like a tease now and again, right? I feel like yeah, I feel I feel like the two of them are kind of built to be together. Personally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, Charles's absence is a huge part of the show and yeah. it means a lot for for Jack and it means a lot for Teach and they've got a they've got an overlap there on the Venn diagram mm-hmm. of of loss and pain, and they get to share it, some of it. So how much does Jack feel personally responsible? Like, is a huge part of his kind of hauntedness at the end of season three because he understands that, I mean, I kind of... I think a large portion... I kind of blame Jack. I think a large portion of Jack feels guilty for it, though he's very good at justifying his actions. Mm -hmm. And here's here's an interesting thing. I heard you guys talk about why, you know, the, the discomfort of seeing Anne and Jack leave... Right oh, away. Yeah, yeah. That is the thing yeah. that we didn't and buy I about totally, that. Yeah. Jack. Right, right. And I totally get it. You know, Clara, Zach, and I all had a chat about it and had a chat to the writers about it. Mm-hmm. But something's very clear to me, even on rewatching it. I went and rewatched that scene to go, did we get this across? Charles says, Right, he go says go. Twice. Yeah, he, he does. Mm hmm. You know, woe betide the man who doesn't take an order from Captain Bane right. twice. Right, for sure, for sure. At the same time, yeah. he does look like he's kind of, you know, Vane can take on right. 10 Spaniards in Right, right. No, he is super good. And he's, and he's dealing he's with a wounded Woods Rogers. The militia that's coming is still pretty much on the horizon. Right. I think that Anne and Jack right. make a snap decision that they will feel guilty about for the rest of their lives. Well, but I think that the, the uh, reasons for the decision are there. Go, says Vane. And then he looks at him and he says, go, exclamation mark. Yeah. And they go. Right. Thinking no, that he'll be 30 seconds behind him. Right. No, and that is, yes, that is yeah. part of the limitation yeah. of the podcasting yeah. because we have to address the episode at hand. Oh, of course. So, like, I made a point in the next episode of about talking about how haunted Jack is. Yeah, it wouldn't be the show it is if you didn't stand screaming at the television at that point. What are you doing, you right. idiots? Go back right. for him. And I reckon they feel right. the same way. Bursting through the brush, they go, oh, what do we do? What do we do? Right. What do we do? He's not behind us. We can't go back now. Oh, oh my Lord. What are we doing? Mm. Mm-hmm. You do have at the sure. very end that Flint wants to go after him, and yeah. Billy's like, "Yo, stop! Yeah. Let's be practical." Yeah. So, right. So you do have introduced in the same episode this element of practicality about what is good for. That's right, and and really simply, who who denies a, a, a vain order twice? Right. right. Yeah, and I do like that. That's very. Yeah. Oh, Charles. Oh, Chaz. <laughs> So wait, you named him Chaz, right? This is one of the ad libs lines. Snuck, like, snuck it through. Yeah. So glad you did. I was feeling particularly naughty that day. And, <laughs> and, then, oh, I like that. and then in the ADR, you know, looping sessions where you go back to sort of, you know, re record dialogue where there was wind sure. over it or they want to change a bit of this. There it was on the sheet. It says it says Chaz to be changed to Charles. Uh. And the sound technician, I was in London at the time. He didn't know the show. He didn't know how serious the notes were. And I very naughtily had the same <laughs> naughty feeling. I just kept it as Chaz. I'm so glad uh-huh. you did. The cut. And I think, that, I think that John, Robert and Dan were a bit, what? Come on, dude. How'd you get that through? I said, well, I got it through twice. <laughs> you know, right? right? <laughs> yeah, I believe that John told us that there are four in, or at least through seasons one through three, there are four ad lib lines. Oh. Three of them are yours. <laughs> there you go. I had license to do it. Did, and you ad libbed 
I have no notes too, right? No was that notes. yours? I did. I can't believe that was the one. God, I love that. I watched that again yesterday and yeah. just again lost my mind. <laughs> I love it. It's delightful. It's okay. perfection. Yes. The girl who played the, the cellist was fantastic and gorgeous and she was studying at the conservatory oh. in Cape Town. Wonderful cellist. She couldn't have been mm. less phased mm. by the whole thing. Like she was like, sure, this is a multi-million dollar Michael Bay pirate entire world you've created here. She was like, I need to basically get back and study for my exams. Oh, really? Are we done? Like, <laughs> they were like, can you hitch your skirt up? <laughs> Lucas was like, oh, who was directing that? Oh, that, that was, was Lucas. That was no, Lucas. No, it was Alec, actually. Oh, okay. was like, then, you know, I'm so sorry, but could you possibly just hitch the skirt up a tiny bit more? Just so I can see a bit of garter because she's supposed to, you know, and she was like, fine, done. Can we just get this stuff? Oh really goodness. have serious things to be doing, like my classical education. Like, okay, cool. So done with your pirate she show. She was so cool. <laughs> she was one of the coolest oh, people ever to step on that fantastic. set. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> She's way cooler than we are, clearly. <laughs> She's way cooler than any of us. I was completely humbled by it. I started off the day being a little patronizing as well. So yeah. I well, welcome to the set. And like, if you need anything, don't be scared by any of this. Just like, it's all cool, man. No. I wish like, I just I wish I just tuned my cello so I could play this properly. Like, okay. <laughs> That's fabulous. Oh. Yeah. Do you have and of course we have to exclude season four, but do you have just this was my favorite day on set. This was my favorite scene where I just feel like th these were the lines I wanted to say or this was the It is so boring an answer to respond that every day on set was that. But it was, Liz, it just was. Oh, God. Like the first scene we filmed um, was, I think it's Ep 3, Jack um, is explaining to the crew why or how he's going to make reparations for having lost the, the pearls and they're kind of going. Yes, and, yes. Um, Hammond's at him and in the distance there's, there's Vane and... Bonnie uh, giving him the eye. It was so much fun. I was in an entire village. That I was surrounded uh -huh. by pirates. I couldn't even see the cameras. The stakes were high. I had men screaming mm. at me. I was like, I've never done anything like this before in my life. And it never stopped. Ah. And so I could talk about the carriage sequence. I could talk about yeah. finally getting to, you know, pull out my sword or, mm -hmm. or the subtle gags I got to do with Featherstone or anything I got to do with, with Clara or Sacks. Curtains. Yeah, that's it. Good old tip <laughs> curtains, feathery. But it, they really were all incredible. Every time they said action oh. on that show, I went, I cannot believe I'm getting to do this. One of our, two of our first on paper, you could call them most boring scenes, which was just walk and talks, you know, it's a bit of information, uh -huh. you know, whilst walking down the street. My first one I did was yes. with Zach as we come out of the big meeting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with all the leads really. Um, and we're walking down, you know, I had my sunglasses on and it was not just a walk and talk. It was great dialogue. An ox came out, <laughs> you know, there was geese everywhere, but this ox and it headed straight for Zach in one take. And Saki could hear at the corner of his mouth going, don't move, I'm just going to walk at this thing. This thing's going to move. And Charles Vane doesn't get another way for an ox. <laughs> at the last moment, the ox just turns I left. I love it. I'm just sweating bullets. I mean, that was just like a, like a West Wing <laughs> walk and talk. Yeah. You know, the one where I have with Clara, which we shot only, only a short time after that, where I end up saying, you know, life right. is too fucking short. Mm -hmm. They let me run with being that loud. I didn't, wasn't supposed to scream it in the street. But once again, oh, there was awesome. people uh -huh. pushing and shoving. And, and yeah. then suddenly here's the brothel owner in my ear and I couldn't see the cameras. Mm. And, and that's just two kind of plot, walk and talk scenes. And they were some of the most exciting things I've ever yeah. done. So climbing up the side of a ship or being in oh. a carriage chase sequence or whatever, I can't actually tell you how fun that was. I'm still processing it. I bet. <laughs>
Oh, I'm so jealous I could spit, but I love it. And I have to say, I, I know it sounds silly, but I'm just legitimately excited for you and happy for you because anytime someone is in a show that they're so excited about that they literally write their own fan fiction, which I have by my bed, thank you very much. It keeps me good company from time to time. When is the full one coming out? It's hopefully yes. coming out um, in, to, to coincide with uh, the first uh, F of season four. That's what I've been told. So it's because I think that comes out. So yeah, so anyone who isn't aware of Toby did a graphic novel about part of the backstory of uh, of Jack and Anne. Yes, yeah. that's what... Uh-huh. I'd written uh, 15 pages of a sequence, basically, where Jack and Anne met. Partly, I think, to try and impress the writers of this show, who I greatly admire. And partly because, you know, uh-huh. trying to keep myself sane in Cape Town. And, and partly because I was really interested in how they met. Oh, yeah. um, what I didn't expect they would be so positive about it. And what I really didn't expect was them to say, we should make this into a comic book. Uh, use that format to tell yes. the story. And I was blown away. I'm a, I'm a comic nerd. And um, it blew my mind. So it was a really exciting thing to happen. That they at least agreed enough with my version of how Jack and Anne uh, met to sort of slide it into the canon in a comic book form. Mm. And I'm really excited that to see is what people think cool. about it too. And as I've said, you know, before, I like the idea that Jack had a little stint in the Royal Navy. I think it explains a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, we dip into just a little bit of that in the comic book. So that's that's so yeah. exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Toby, for your insight, for your humor, for just, you know, being charming and nice to us when you stop being mean to me. You've got to start by pulling the pink tiles, <laughs> okay. right? Okay, we have no record of the mean, but Toby, thank you. It's been so lovely, and thank you for being really our guardian angel from the beginning. You were the first person yeah, from so production so. who made us feel like we were doing I, something that was fun for you all as well. I couldn't be more pleased to be here and um, to be talking mm. about this show. Well done, guys. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. I'll speak to you on the other end. We'll do it again. All right. Yeah. We'll hold you to that. Oh, I'll be listening to you next week. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. We'll have a special treat for you. Well, that was everything that we could have hoped for, I think. I would say and more. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner with Jack. And I drinks. Know. Scotch with Jack. Slash Toby. I know. We got to hang out with Toby <laughs> and Jack. We did. Lucky girls. I Best know. Best day ever. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Um, so, yeah, so that was fabulous. This was the last episode of our countdown to season four because next week is the beginning of season four. Which is so exciting. Yes, which is so exciting. So, just to tell everyone, um, next week we will be live tweeting 401. Yes. Episode Boy, that's exciting. Right. Episode twenty nine uh-huh. of Black Sales. So we're gonna we're gonna be live tweeting every single episode of season four at nine PM Eastern Standard Time in the US when it airs on stars. Wow. And yeah, it's going to be a whole new game for us because we'll be doing a season that we've never seen before. Which is so exciting. So and- exciting. And we will be dropping our podcast episodes uh, right after the episode airs that same night. So um, cheers. Cheers to everyone. Yes, yeah. Cheers and join in. It's going to be a good time. This has been a fun month of Count Doom special Mm. episodes. And we hope that everyone's enjoyed them. And we'll see you next week in season four. And if you haven't jumped in yet, it's easy to find. And you can catch up even on Twitter. Just use the hashtag Fathoms Deep. Yep, absolutely. We can't wait. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.
Okay, wait. We took a break. Pour some more. Yeah. There, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them coming there, Toby. No. What are we paying no, you there's for? A point yeah. where you, there's a point where you have to cut me off because I do sometimes okay. drink too much. Right, I'll keep it over here on my side. 